Please welcome back William Aldroyd. So I'll, I'll start with a, a couple of questions. Uh, it's a, the film is a, a strikingly modern period piece in, in many ways, in, in, in its look and its tone um, and its characterizations. And I'm wondering if uh, you were drawn to the sort of inherent modernity of the text or, or did you see that there was something there that was worth updating or modernizing? Well, I think when Alice Birch, the uh, screenwriter, suggested, she brought the book to me and said she thought it would be a good film. <clears throat> what we felt was possibly modern about it was that Catherine acted, um, what were her actions felt modern because of the period in which she lived. So essentially, she wasn't expected to do these things because of the society of 1865. And that's what made her feel modern. But I think that what Alice did in terms of the dialogue she wrote and the way in which she wrote the script is what probably helped to lift it and make it feel modern. Plus, also Florence's interpretation of that character. You know, she actually, as a young woman, is probably quite s a similar age and, and has similar sort of feelings to Catherine. So actually, it wasn't a great leap for her to actually take on this character and make it her own. And she wanted to defend Catherine, so probably actually her reactions to the things that happened to Catherine with those men um, was honest and truthful and, and probably uh, appropriate. So there was never any talk of um, changing the time period, right? We did, we did think about it. There's a lovely film I saw called Elena, Andres Vagancia's film yeah. about mm -hmm. it, which um, for me feels a bit like a sort of... Yeah sort of short Dostoevsky story or something and we did, we did think maybe we could update this and make it into a contemporary story but actually that sense of isolation that you get in the book when you think of where she is in Russia in 1865 uh, was very very useful to us and so we thought if we updated it in England it's very easy for her to jump on the train or to pick up the phone or you know actually we needed to keep her isolated <laughs> And Northumberland in 1865 provided that. You know, that was, we found it very helpful. Right. So obviously you did change the setting. Can you talk a little bit about why Northumberland and what, you know, what did you think worked? Well, I knew that area because I'd studied at university in Durham, mm -hmm. which is very close to where we shot the film. And so I knew, I knew that you know, when you have a small budget um, and you're making a period drama, you you've got to find a place wh which looks like it hasn't potentially changed for 150 years and there were a lot of wild moors that we could use for free up in the northeast of England um, where we didn't have to sort of avoid pylons and factories and so on. It's just, you know, we had to be selective where, where we pointed the camera. Um, it is also the least populated part of the UK which was helpful in terms of creating the isolation that we wanted to keep from the Russian book. Mm -hmm. And I just really like that area. I mean, I really like the people up there. I had got to know them over my years of being at university and worked with them then when I was working in theatre. Um, so I wanted to go back, and it felt like a good place to do it. Can you talk a little bit about the casting? Um, I think this is Florence Pugh's second film. I would not seen her anything before, and she's obviously amazing in this. Uh, and Cosmo Jarvis, I don't think, has had, had that much acting experience before either. Uh, how, was there an extensive search, and, and what were you looking for with these roles? Well, I think well, Shaheen Baig, who's the casting director, she's very good at actually trying to find the right person for the part, rather than an actor who potentially has it in their range, somebody who is as close as possible to the, the character that we're looking for. And she had cast um, a film called The Falling a few years ago, when that was Florence's first have a job. She was 17 and at school when she was in that film. So she knew her and she introduced her, her to us when we were looking for Catherine. And it was very clear to us when we met her that she was absolutely you know, perfect for this part. She came in a couple of times, we worked with her and then we put her with various Sebastians and <coughs> saw how they would play with each other. And um, yeah, we opened the casting up to everybody. I mean, we, we saw everybody for every part. Um, and then we chose the best actor for the job, and we were we were very lucky. I think you know we I think Cosmo's great. Naomi, who played Anna, fantastic. 
they're, they're good and, and so nice to find people who you know, are not immediately recognisable but who obviously are very talented and are going to go on and do great things, I think. Also, um, you talked about the character of uh, Anna, just the in introducing the um, element of, of race in addition to you know, questions of gender and class that are obviously built into the text. Um, can you talk about that? A we don't see, um, you know, maybe Andrew Arnold's Wuthering Heights, the black Heathcliff is a recent exception, but we don't often see you know, black or mixed race characters in, in 19th century English films. Yes, and I think that's, I think that's um, not only a shame, but it's also inaccurate. Um, I think what we found when we were researching this film is that the photographic material from the mid 19th century was was showing that the, the culture of the northeast of England was far more diverse than we were led to believe from uh, period dramas, BBC period dramas, um, British period dramas that represent and show the Victorian era or that, that, a that age. So once we knew that, once we knew that we actually could cast whoever we wanted, it meant that we were able to open up the casting process to anybody. And as I said, we then met everybody regardless of background for each part and then cast the best person accordingly. Just to come back to what I was asking you about uh, in terms of the modernity of, 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 of the text and, and of Alice Birch's script, but I think you've also developed a very modern a visual language uh, to match that. Um, it's, it's a very spare film in many ways, which also I think distinguishes it from a lot of period pieces. Um, it's unusual to see so little on, on walls in a, a period drama, um, and it's, it's quite refreshing. And, and you, I, I don't know if your theatre background comes into that at all? Or well, we felt like the, there was a sort of austerity of everything in this. There was an austerity of emotion, austerity of language, um, austerity of design. Actually, some of the paintings that I had seen... So, I mean, what tends to happen in the UK is when you do a production of Ibsen, everybody reaches for the same book, which is a catalogue from a Royal Academy show by Willem Hammershaw, the Danish artist. And his um, interiors are very s sort of sparse. Um, they're quite the, the light is very interesting because it is a sort of, um, it's quite a light um, northern European light, so it sort of feels airy and so on. And he usually has sort of one, if people know these paintings, one sort of central figure, usually a woman, usually wearing black, facing away from the viewer. So she's sort of faceless and robbed of personality. And I thought this, these are quite useful references for us because Catherine is essentially robbed of personality. She denied personality by these men. And I could see her standing there by a window in this. So we use that as the sort of the beginning for our exploration in terms of design. And so we found this castle in the northeast of England, which was empty, and actually we didn't want to clutter it. We thought that what we've seen before in the sort of Victorian period dramas uh, have gone before, they tend to be very dark and they're sort of heavy drapery and it's um, very sort of claustrophobic. We wanted to try and create a sort of vacuum in a way that was that used that northeastern light that we saw but then, but then actually made the room airless. So when she goes outside, then that's where she has that, that freedom. I'm sure there are many audience questions, so I think we should open it up. Uh, yes, sir? So question about music and Hitchcock? Yes? <laughs> okay, and Wuthering Heights. Oh, okay. Well, let's try to handle all of that. Um, well, with the music, um, I wonder whether Nick's here. Maybe he is. There he is. <laughs> I love score in film, but I wanted to, <laughs> I have to say that because we really did have some money in the budget to pay a composer, but we um, thought, let's see whether we can create what we want to do with um, the actors and the emotion of the actors and the edit and see whether the scene will work without, I, I'm sort of, I, as most people are, I'm sure, against the notion of, of emotional signposting because I feel like that's not how... That's not good score, basically, but... And some films that I've really loved have not used music, so I thought, well, let's, go f let's start there and then see what we need, and we can just add in a bit at a time. And actually, as we did some sort of early screenings for our execs, I was constantly asking, what do you think? Do you think it sort of is working without, this, without music? And they said, yeah. So we just said, okay, well, then let's just, you know, make sure that... You know, if if it needs it, and uh, then then the the three murders are then just just underlined slightly with a sort of tonal, 
Um, but it's interesting you point out that you heard music at the end because we had used it twice before and I think that, that that's happened. Yeah, people haven't, and if you haven't noticed it, then, then it's working for me, basically. That's, uh, that's a good sign, yeah. It, but it's just, it was to sort of just accent more than anything else. Um, but the next thing, I really hope to use music. I mean, I really would like to do that. But um, uh, Hitchcock, I'm not sure about this reference. I, I, um, I've, I mean, it's, I think it's a handy thing to put on a poster. Um, Hitchcock meets Wuthering Heights. Um, and if it means people will come and see the film, great. But I wouldn't ever say that I was Hitch Alfred Hitchcock. I mean, I, I think, or that this is sort of, you know, we weren't trying to make a Hitchcockian thriller. But, um, and, and what's interesting about Wuthering Heights is that I, I was really surprised that um, I hadn't seen Lady Macbeth and the Tents as a film before. I mean, I know there is a film that Andre Vider made in the 80s, which I hadn't actually seen when we made this, but, um, you know, Wuthering Heights is produced time and time again, and I'm, I'm very interested that people, people haven't, apart from the opera, which is very famous, people haven't made this uh, novella into a film before. It's quite interesting, and I'm quite grateful that it hadn't been, you know. The question is about um, editing and uh, the use of quick cuts, which function uh, to this viewer sort of like emotional cues, uh, the way a conventional score might. Well, what's great is that Nick Emerson, who was our editor, was also the editor on Starred Up. I don't know whether you saw David McKenzie's film, which is a contemporary prison drama. And so I thought it would be great if we got the editor of a contemporary prison drama to come and edit a British period drama, because actually if he could bring some of that energy into our film, it might help you know, with those, quite, those jump cuts and those sudden cuts. And then he was really great at, you know, he, he loves uh, Fincher, David Fincher, and he was saying that <coughs> David Fincher very often will come into a scene just a beat or two late, and then will leave the scene a beat or two earlier than you expect, which keeps tension. So these little tricks that he was, you know, and actually the idea that a scene doesn't need to resolve in itself, but actually the thought will carry into the next scene. And if you cut something, there's often a sort of residue or a, the idea remains, even if the scene's gone. As I learned a hell of a lot from him, and he was, on, he was on set with us. And because we shot in sequence, we shot in order, because uh, we were in this one house, we were able to do that. By the end of the third week, he'd actually sort of roughly assembled the first three quarters of the film, which we could watch on the Sunday afternoon, which is sort of terrifying, because had it been terrible, we would have had the worst last week. <laughs> But actually what we saw was like, well, okay, it's, okay, it's, it's sort of there. You know, the, we, n we know that the scenes are... But what was missing, we could then plan to shoot in our last week as a pickup, so that we knew that we were covering it in terms of the story and so on. But having him there he was just invaluable. Also, you know, every lunchtime, every evening going in and just watching what we'd done, he would roughly assemble the scenes and then he would be able to feed back, you know, saying, I want to do this in one shot. And he would say, yeah, but can you also get me one or two others just to cover it so that we have that, you know, insurance later on. Because what I realized actually was that I was always, coming from a theater background, I was always looking for the point of the filmmaking process, which was like the rehearsal. So I thought maybe the rehearsal before we, shoot, we shot was the rehearsal, or maybe the, the shoot was the rehearsal, could we try some things out? But actually what I've found was that the edit was the place where actually we could say, what about if we tried this, and this isn't going to work, let's try this. But if we didn't have the other option, then we were stuck. And so actually having that coverage, which I at first thought was a dirty word, I thought, you know, coverage makes it sound quite generalised, <coughs> was essential, because then we did have the option to do what we wanted and make those changes later on. But the edit was, for me, was the most sort of enlightening part of this whole process, really. Yeah, right in the back. Question about Anna and the, and the subject of diversity, um, which I think you did address. But yeah, I did. I did mention. Yeah. Um, well, what can I say? I mean, Anna is an amalgamation of several characters that are in the book, and we've made Anna because um, we there was a fourth act which we didn't have in the film, where they get actually um, Catherine and Sebastian are caught after the murder of Teddy, and then they're sent away to Siberia to a penal colony, and on that journey. Sebastian then starts to f f uh, fall in love with another woman, which makes Catherine jealous, and then she ends up killing them in the sea. So we <laughs> thought it was probably easier to end it where we did, and certainly cheaper. Um, 
But we wanted to try and build that jealousy in, so that's why when Sebastian feels most sort of destitute and alone, he goes to Anna, and that then makes Catherine jealous of that relationship, even though actually she hasn't done anything, you know. And I think of Anna and Catherine as two of the, uh, as, as two sort of very similar, two very similar people, because they're both servants in the sense that Catherine is a servant to the bedroom, and Anna is a servant to the house. And actually their backgrounds are very similar, except that Catherine happens to be married into the family and therefore she has higher status and her word is worth more than Anna's. Um, but it's interesting that they then actually are antagonistic towards each other rather than actually forming a friendship. But, you know. Question about the scene where Sebastian reveals the murder and whether there was coverage um, in which you shot the reactions of the other <laughs> characters. There's a few things here because actually this whole, because it's the first film I've made, that I, it was a real process of learning, and I realized actually that what had been the sort of engine uh, in theater is usually the spoken word, but what I was finding in cinema was actually that it was about trying to capture thought. And this, for me, is a really good example because <coughs> I had worked with Florence beforehand in our rehearsals to make sure that every thought was clear. <coughs> in that moment, of course, what she's dealing with is essentially a public breakup, which she can't reveal. She, you know, she's attached whatever, she, whatever passion she has to this man, and he comes in, breaks up with her in front of everybody, then actually confesses to the murder, and, and she's thinking, how am I going to get out of this one? Uh, and then she has to think quickly about what she's going to do in order to save herself. And all of that is happening, and I, I think when I watched it back, uh, on the screen, I thought, God, I can see all of that happening with Florence, what she was thinking. I saw it all, and in a way, actually, I didn't ever want to cut away from her face. So the first edit was just her, and everybody else was heard. And then somebody told me that I was being perverse and stupid, and actually, you know, if you are sitting watching that and you feel like you should be, there was a, um, a need to see another person, then we should cut to that other person. And it felt like Sebastian was the the right person to cut to because of you know what he was going through. Um, but yes, I, I, it was about the scene was about those two and what they were going through. So that's why. So yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay, we can take uh, two more questions. Yes. Um, well. <laughs> um, but he doesn't consummate the marriage, but that he has, has that Teddy is, turns up. Yeah, um, well, it is in the book, yeah. It's not quite the same because it's not his son, it's a ward. So it's somebody who he's adopted, really. But we thought it would be much more interesting if he just. I think for me, there's so many people in this film who are trapped. Catherine is obviously trapped and she fights against that. but. Alexander is trapped too and can't really return until his father's dead. Um, and I like the idea that actually he doesn't sleep with Catherine's because it's his last sort of defiance against his father. His father has basically bought this wife for him and told him that he has to provide the family with an heir. And actually he decides he won't do that, so he decides not to sleep with her. But actually elsewhere he has. I think that's what he's done. And then suddenly this boy turns up once Alexander goes missing and um, that's really where that sort of idea came from. Yep. The question is about how you chose your director of photography and how you worked with him. Well, with her, Ari Wegner is a fantastic Australian cinematographer. <laughs> I'd seen a film she made called Ruin, which was in the horizontal section of Venice and um, was absolutely fantastic. It follows a young woman in Cambodia and what she goes through. Um, and then she had made an, uh, a Tasmanian TV series called The Kettering Incident, or it's Australian but filmed in Tasmania. And um, I, I wasn't able to see the series but saw the, s the, f the stills that she shot and they were just fantastic. But because she lives in Melbourne, a lot of our work was done on Skype. So the first two weeks of prep, we did, I would get up early and we would then work for six hours in the morning. and we would go through, we would sort of make a sort of shot list. So I would draw something down that I thought, and then I would hold it up to the camera, and then she would draw something down and hold it up to the camera. And that happened for about two weeks. 
But the good thing is that if she had an idea of something, she said, oh, that reminds me of this film where this, then actually, when we signed off Skype, I could go and watch that film and then the next morning come back having seen the thing and we could carry on from there. So it was really good work. And actually, by the time I got to meet her in person, I felt like I really knew her very well. And then we had a couple more weeks before we actually shot the film. But she's, um, she's brilliant. And the good thing about Ari is that she spent a lot of time really trying to understand who Catherine was. Like she went through, like a sort of actor, really, she, uh, her approach to the script. So when she came to shoot the film, she wasn't really ever thinking, where am I meant to be standing or looking? Because she knew. She had made an emotional connection to Catherine and to Florence. And so she was always in the right position, always looking for the right things. And I think that really comes across in her work in Lady Macbeth. All right, we have time for a final question. So let's... Um, yeah. The question is about the, the role of a cat. <laughs> I'm very glad you asked that question because um, the cat's getting a lot of recognition, actually. <laughs> it's going to be a very famous cat. And it's the art director's sister's cat, not a professional cat, but it's now maybe it will get a, a star on the walk of fame or something. But, um, well, in the book, um, sort of strange thing happens when Boris dies, the cat starts to speak with Boris's voice and actually even uh, Catherine sees Boris's face on the cat, which is uh, completely strange, but, you know, not unusual considering she has killed him and she's hallucinating. But uh, we did try to put some of Boris's lines in the mouth of the cat, uh, which is when you see the cat sitting at the table. Uh, and it was so terrible that um, <laughs> we immediately cut it, and I was, wish I'd never done that. Um, but s people have said, actually, that they can see a bit of Boris in the cat, which is not very fair to Chris, who plays Boris, but because it's essentially a hairless cat. But it's, um, I think there is something there, you know, with the, the idea of the cat sort of, you know, being his familiar or being like when when he goes away he leaves the cat to watch her the cat is sort of policing her in the way that all the other members of the household are and there's another pair of eyes and then when Boris dies the cat goes down to the body and then he just sits in Boris's chair after that I mean I think yeah that's where we, I mean god I don't know I mean it's <laughs> <laughs> it was fun having that I mean the cat was, yeah I think it's a good note to end on. Um, Will, thank you so much for the film. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much for coming.